Hi, and welcome to Geek Legion of Doom. I'm Bobby, I'm the host of Terribly Fun Films, and I'd like to thank Leo for having me back on this show. Uh, you know, Twitter's background is different. It may look a little odd. Camera angle might be a little bit weird. It's balanced on top of a bed right now. Got back from Dragon Con, had to go straight into prep and to evacuate from Hurricane Irma. So it's taken me a little bit longer to be able to watch the movie we're discussing today and get this review out than I would have liked. With that in mind though, we are reviewing the sci-fi film Beyond the Trek, aka Helios, which is the much better, more accurate title that I believe they should have stuck with. You can probably tell by the uh, title they stuck it with in terms of the DVD release, Beyond the Trek. It is a sci-fi film. But it has nothing to do with Star Trek. It's not a fan movie, no characters, no Federation, anything like that. So, is it any good? Stop if you've heard this one before. A group of humans are in deep space when they are sent on a salvage and recovery mission due to a distress signal they receive from a different ship. Things then begin to go wrong. If your brain went to Alien, if it went to Event Horizon, if it went to uh, Disney's The Black Hole. You wouldn't be wrong there, though. The basic plot of the film, is, is, uh, the thing it uses to instigate what's happening, has been done quite a bit before in science fiction movies, books, what have you. In this case, though, they do change it up a little bit. Our main humans are all genetically modified. They're called GM humans. Genetically modified humans. Think like Gattaca in terms of you can control your genes, the parents control your genes before birth, that sort of thing. Uh, and that gives it an interesting twist. Um, there's a few issues I'll get into a little bit. So they get there, there's one human survivor and one um, android who uh, witnessed all the death and destruction that happened on the ship and they're trying to piece everything together before whatever caused it comes back and wreaks havoc with them. Written and directed by Ian Trutner. I don't know if I'm saying that totally right. I'm sorry if I'm not. Uh, the movie feels like it's a labor of love. It feels like it is uh, an homage to the clip spent on his favorite sci-fi films, Alien, Gattaca, Event Horizon, things like that, um, while still being mostly original enough in order to come to its own, and a lot of that comes down to the writing and the characterization. The GM humans are defined by several different things. One of them is their even temperament. They don't get that emotionally invested in things. Causes a little bit of issues in the beginning of the film. We'll get to that when I discuss. But watching how this stressful situation, how they're trying to figure out the best way to get the information out of the soul surviving human, is interesting. Seeing how it plays with their brain, seeing how being in deep space this long is uh, messing with things they want or thought they want or how they interpret mission orders. Is really well thought out. The characters are all very well defined. Very different. You won't confuse anybody with anybody else. So, uh, each at least gives their own mini arc throughout the film. So, everybody is changed somehow by the end of the film. And balancing that is a tricky act, and I think they do that very, very well here. Uh, plot wise, as they just stated, it does feel like a bunch of those other movies I named. Um, there's enough originality in terms of how the pieces are put together for me to not call it a direct ripoff of any one thing, but that does not mean 
it is 100% successful in that regard all the time. Does that make sense? It, it does have a little bit of a been there, done that feel. Certain plot points you can kind of see coming and be right. You know what I mean? Helping the writing is, of course, True Whitner's own directing of his own screenplay. And it's pretty good. It does lack a definitive style in terms of it doesn't overcome its obvious B-movie limitations to look fancier or that sort of thing than what it clearly had at its disposal. But, in terms of pacing and uh, especially when things jump up at the end, things go very, very right and the movie's constantly engaging. There's not a ton of action in the film. There are a few action beats, but it's very much the dialogue and the drama. And so this more like low-key directing style kind of enhances that. Does take away from some of the action though. As directing-wise, the big action scene at the end is a kind of edited very messily. Um, it's not the strongest in that regard. A lot of the editing is off a little bit sometimes. Um, not everything, not every edit, but the editing is probably the weakest technical aspect here, with one exception. That exception is the production design, specifically design of the ship, and I'll get to that very specifically in a moment, and their weapons and props and things like that. Specifically, the weapons they use look like really cheap painted over paintball guns that they've been in sort of blue LED lights on and it does not work. And I'm not sure if it doesn't work because it looks kind of goofy or if it doesn't work because while they're having these weapons in order to properly charge them they have what I can only describe as blue half suspenders it's not really a holster, but it's like these weird things that are going around their shoulders. It's not really suspenders, it's not really a holster. They also have these lights on them. And it looks goofy as fuck. It looks so stupid and so hilarious that maybe one of the reasons I'm disappointed in the action scenes is I couldn't stop laughing at that. It was ridiculous. The ship, the, the main ship, the ship, they're in to rescue this other ship has this weird thing about it where its design is nice but it has this thing spinning around it that looks like 24 coke cans crunched up and then lined up in a sort of wave pattern that's just floating around the ship so my hands the ship it's just going like this circling the ship for no apparent reason. It never comes up. It doesn't do a damn thing. And I kept asking myself with with him watching the movie whenever they showed the ship, why that exists? Who what agent what what corporation spent money on this ship and then added this pointless thing for no reason? It doesn't make the ship stand out at all. It makes it look stupid and that really hurt some of the earlier sequences because that's when we get a lot of our shots of the exterior of the ship. Does not work there, guys. This movie feels like it thinks it has something to say at the end, and it doesn't. Its ending doesn't really change anything. It doesn't save humanity from, like, a xenomorph threat. It's a character sacrificing him or herself for one particular other person. But before that happens, he or she tells the person they're saving to go tell your story to Earth. But it means nothing. Like, it wouldn't matter. I am really trying to think of a way of not spoiling this to get that issue across. Basically, when this person gets to Earth and does tell his or her story, 
it wouldn't change anything. It wouldn't change what Earth is doing, how they're sending people into space. It would just be, hey, here's a story of what happened to the people who rescued me. Let's move on with our lives. And that makes it very frustrating to watch because it feels like it doesn't have a purpose. And finally, I tell the goofy blue lights on everything. The biggest issue with the movie is the set design because it all looks so generically sci-fi. This looks like Prometheus. It looks like Elysium. It looks like the space station on Elysium. It it doesn't have an original visual aside from that weird, awkward, spinny thing in front of the ship for no apparent reason. Um, to his bone. And while the directing is solid and the cinematography is nice, it's a movie that won't involve you visually whatsoever because of that, and that makes it very frustrating to watch because there's clearly talent there. A lot of love went into the movie, and there's a lot to admire about it. But I'm not sure how much one will actually enjoy it versus admiring it because visually speaking, you've seen it all before, and it doesn't reconfigure the visuals in a new interesting way, the way it does some of its recycled plot points and uh, story beats. The costumes are actually relatively good. The, uh, the uniforms uh, look very snazzy. Uh, the androids, especially the androids, hair and makeup by Kelly Capioca, David Charles, Dina Marie DeAngelis, Andrea Farrell, Sharice Fine, Iniana Gorlick, Garrett Ivanola and Samantha Ward are fantastic. Uh, Roman Hovalik's score is perfect and fantastic and amazing. And I can't praise it enough. The score is beautiful. It's very impressive. Very intense. It delivers on all fronts that have to. And I'm really glad uh, for that because it'll help you stay immersed even when there are other issues abounding. We're dealing with a really small cast this go round. Uh, Sonny Mabry is Iris Duncan, one of our uh, genetically modified humans. And she's very good because my favorite performance in the movie, especially with some stuff that happens with her at the end that doesn't mean as much as the movie thinks it does. A uh, character's sacrifice doesn't go over well because inherently within just what was sped up about these characters about genetically modified humans and what they're trying to pick up and say it doesn't matter it doesn't matter at all so I don't think that works but I think she plays it very well I, I thanks to the score and her acting the scene feels big and heroic and it's when you stop and think about it that this is kind of where the writing does let you down because it's not but the fact that I was invested whatsoever thanks to her acting uh, Lance Broadway plays Commander Linden the and he's very no nonsense very serious all the time and he's good he's the most boring of the actors but he also has the most boring characterization so I'm not sure how much of that's him versus just the characters he's given. Because his character doesn't even have a single joke or quip. He's super serious. All the time. <laughs> Which works within context of the film. So I'm not complaining about that. But it does mean he doesn't get to stretch his acting muscles that much. So if he's on screen, things will be a little bit dour. The genetically modified human Chris is played by T.J. Hoban. He's very good. He, as we progress, they're all getting a bit more emotional than they should be, a bit more aggressive than they should be. Uh, and I think he plays that very well. He finds that nice balance from the beginning to the end. Uh, never overdoes it, never overstates it. And that makes certain aspects of his character really interesting. I'm trying to be vague. It's a new movie just came out last Tuesday so I don't 
want to have that many spoilers, so I am being vague. So if this doesn't totally make sense, I'm sorry. Uh, but Mr. Hoban does a very good job. Then we have Christian Kitra as Emma Anderson, one of the other crew members. Jankery is modified, of course. Uh, and she's good. She gets to be the most flirty and fun straight off the bat. Uh, making her one of the more relatable characters up front. Uh, but she's a lot of fun. And what she does is get a big action scene. It's She holds her own very nicely. Finally, for our genetically modified humans, we have Mikkel Shannon Jenkins as the doctor on board. And he's good. Once he starts getting more emotional, it comes out as very aggressive and very violent, and he does come across as creepy and dangerous. And I really enjoyed that. Like, there are actual stakes from the movie because of that, and I don't know if another actor could have pulled that off as well. The android I mentioned earlier is named Lulu AH320, played by Ursula Mills, and she's fantastic. It's a bit hard to describe everything the character has to do, but she pulls it all off very well. Playing our surviving human from the ship that's being rescued, Travis, is Wheatus Crin. I'm not making that name up. W-E-E-T-U-S space capital C-R-E-N. Wheatus Crin. He's okay. He doesn't have too many lines. Um, just believable lines are when he's discussing Lulu and trying to help her. Um, but some of the sciencey bit doesn't don't sound that convincing. Finally, cast wise, we have Michael Nuri, probably best known for his role in Flashdance as Nordum, who's one of the agents in charge of like mission control basically back on Earth. He's one of the people who sent him on this mission. And he's good. He's fine. Not maybe eight minutes of screen time, not a ton of screen time, but he's solid in it. If you're a hardcore, serious sci fi fan, you want to see a movie that takes itself seriously and treats science fiction with respect, go ahead and watch it. You won't have totally wasted your time. But if you're just a B movie fan or a low budget fan, they want to see what they're doing and that sort of thing. These ideas have been done better elsewhere. That's not to say they're bad here. They're just not as important as the movie thinks it is because we don't know this movie's world at all, which is probably one of the issues within the writing that doesn't make the ending work. We don't know this earth. We don't know any other characters outside of the ones I mentioned. So why does it matter? You know? So I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. Strong acting, interesting take on some recycled material, really amazing score, but you'll guess where certain pop points are going, and because the production design is so bad, and the visuals feel so samey, you won't want to rewatch it ever. As always, I've been your host, Bobby. I'm from Terribly Fun Films. You can find all my stuff there. I would like to thank Leo for having me back in Geek Legion of Doom, and I'll see you next time. Bobbly-bobbly-simo. Bobbly-bobbly-simo.